When we started to be here, Ryan and I have been talking back and forth for a couple of years. He's extremely open to ideas. Um, being cool, I'll take any compliment I can get at my age. So that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'll take it. So I appreciate being here. I uh, practiced spine surgery for over 30 years in Seattle, Washington. Four of those years were in Sun Valley, Idaho, where this whole project originated. The reason why we think the book has been so effective is I suffered from chronic pain myself for over 15 years. And I came out by luck. I didn't know what happened to me. Nobody could tell me exactly what's going on. And I just floundered for 15 solid years. It was just brutal. And I got lucky, and by 2003 I came out of it. I still didn't know what had happened. I literally went from a fearless surgeon to crippling anxiety and panic attacks in one day. <clears throat> so I, uh, the wheels came off. And then I came back to Seattle in 2003. I started sharing some of these tools with my patients. And by 2006, things had started to come together. And in 2011, I heard a lecture by Dr. Howard Schumann in Detroit that explained the neuroscience of the body under stress. And there's over 30 physical symptoms that occur when your body's under chemical assault from stress hormones, over 30. I had 17 of those at the same time. I was sitting next to my wife, Babs, during that lecture, and he started checking out the symptoms. She started poking me. And in, and in 10 minutes, I figured out the prior 20 years of suffering. It, it made total sense. The last five years of neuroscience research has been unbelievable. We know how to solve, <coughs> solve chronic pain. And of course, to solve anything, you have to understand the problem first. So I would like to introduce you to Esty. We held a workshop <coughs> at the Omega Institute in New York in 2013. I had no idea what I was doing. I figured I had five days with these people, and I just want to take concepts that I knew affected pain and put them into a workshop. I had no expectations, and Esty was coming from New York. She signed up for the workshop by accident. She thought it was a headache workshop, and she had had severe neck pain, left side of her neck, for four years. She had seen 10 physicians. She was on high-dose narcotics. She had received six injections in her neck and kept spiraling down and down and down. So I'm standing there in this workshop, and I'm looking at about 15, 20 people, and Essie's in the front row holding her neck just like this and just glaring at me. And I'm going, oh my God, what's gonna happen this week? That was my first exposure to the whole workshop process. You're gonna come out today with just a couple concepts. I'm also gonna warn you that your life is gonna to change today, whether you like it or not. Now, you can choose to go deep and change it a lot, or just have a little bit, but what's gonna happen, your filter's gonna change. You're gonna see anxiety in a different manner, and going forward, as we know from neuroplasticity, your brain changes every second. In medical school, you know, we were taught that the brain was static, it could only shrink with age, we all know about the pruning process, which does occur during the first five years of life, but we now know the brain changes every second. Your brain's already changed, right? But it's gonna change differently in a permanent way because you're gonna get a different filter. And then I'm gonna show you some tools that I want you to leave with that'll continue the changes. So the bottom line is anxiety is the pain. This is not a psychological phenomenon. The goal of my talk today is to discuss the neurochemical nature of anxiety. I personally treated it, quote, psychologically. I went into intense counseling psychotherapy for 13 solid years. It only got worse. We also know that anxiety disorders get worse. The prognosis for OCD, bipolar, all these things which are anxiety driven, eating disorders, et cetera, it's a very poor prognosis. Well, you can't treat a neurochemical problem psychologically. So I was diligent, I, went, I honestly went to psychotherapy every week for 13 years and continued to spiral downwards. My symptoms got worse, my anxiety got worse, it all got worse. I want you to also understand that mental pain is a much bigger problem than physical pain because it changes the body's chemistry and creates physical symptoms. The essence of the solution is learning to regulate your body's chemistry. And the essence of the entire process of solving pain is which each one of us seeks every day is to feel safe. 
Because when you're under stress and under threat, your body's full of stress chemicals. When you feel safe, you have great chemicals, different chemical environment, you simply feel differently. One of the worst things that happened in medicine was in the 16, 1700s, Descartes separated the mind versus the body. Consider a Boeing 747 jet. Consider flying this jet without a computer. Not gonna work, right? Consider flying the computer without a jet. That's not gonna work either. But that computer is analyzing the flap angles, the tire pressure, the wind speed, all sorts of things are being monitored by these sensors that you put into a computer, makes adjustments, and you're able to fly this airplane. The Boeing jet has about two million parts to it. Guess how many, just take a guess, how many cells do you think there are in the human body? Just somebody th throw out a number. 50 trillion, 50 trillion cells. There are 80 billion nerve cells just in the nervous, just in your skull. There are 1 million pain receptors per square inch in your skin and fascial layers. If you got rid of every tissue in the body except your nerves, you would still look almost the same. We're just a unit, it's just a unit response. I don't like the terms anymore of mind-body syndrome or tension myositis syndrome or stress illness syndrome. And I'm honestly, and I'm open to suggestions, trying to come up with a term that reflects a unit response. Because when you're upset, it's not that your, your mind's reacting, your whole body's reacting, right? And when you feel emotions, you have to feel the emotion to be an emotion. So I could tell you someday, well, someday we're gonna go to a nuclear war. Well, that's anxiety producing, but that's not the same as that somebody, somebody that actually threaten you and you feel a chemical surge. So you actually have to have a chemical change to feel an emotion. So the human body is similar to the jet, a little bit more complicated. We're analyzing all the sensory input. My term for the nervous system is the junction box, peripheral nervous system, autonomic central nervous system. And then each input is competing simultaneously for attention. So the sum total is generally neutral. As you know, it's called the nociceptive system. And the nociceptive system is actually backwards from what I was taught in medical school. So it's taught if you put your hand close to a hot stove and felt pain, that's nociceptive pain. That's not true. What happens is that the nociceptive system keeps me in a range of behavior that's safe. So I'm not staring at that light. I shouldn't have done that. Um, and so it's, just, it, it's automatic. It just keeps you in a range of behaviors that's safe. So most of the time you're in a neutral zone. So when you feel too much brightness, too loud, too hot, too cold, that you've exceeded the nociceptive limits. So what we actually call nociceptive pain is in the nociceptive system, but you've actually exceeded the limits. So the nociceptive system isn't causing the pain, it's when you see those limits, you have the pain. So most of the time we're neutral. If it's pleasant, then you have release of oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, the GABA drug, similar to Valium. If it's unpleasant, you have adrenaline, noradrenaline, histamines, endorphins, cortisol. And so every second, your body is taking a sensory input, adjusting, changing your body's chemical makeup, working on your motor system, on a non-distance system, and your sensory system to change everything to help you survive. So, when this happens, this dog jumps out at you, that's a physical threat. Again, the sum total is gonna to be unpleasant. So you have the adrenaline, cortisol, and histamine, and you feel anxious. But if you're lying on the beach, and the sun relaxing, and you are full of oxytocin, dopamine, cortisol, I'm sorry, oxytocin and dopamine and the serotonins, you feel relaxed. Relaxed is a descriptive term. How many would call relaxed a diagnosis? Okay. When you're doing this, and you're full of adrenaline, cortisol, and the stress drugs, you feel, how do you feel? Anxious. Anx anxiety is just a descriptive term, just like relaxed is a descriptive term. It is not a diagnosis. It describes the state of your body's chemistry when you're under a threat. Okay? That's why if you try to treat it psychologically, it's not going to work. Can't work. Here's the basic problem. 
the unconscious brain, of which anxiety just says danger, also remember anxiety is so unpleasant that it compels you to take action. Every living creature has anxiety, every one. Now we have a term for it, humans can put a word on it called anxiety, but every living creature has a survival response. The creatures that did not pay attention to that sensation, of course, didn't survive. Turns out the human race isn't really survival of the fittest, it's survival of the most anxious. If you don't pay attention to your visual cues or <clears throat> your environmental cues, you're not gonna survive. The unconscious brain processes 11 million bits of information per second. The conscious brain processes 40. Okay, 11 million, 40. Okay, so you have this massive survival response. We call it anxiety. Who you are as a human is this conscious brain over here, which is 40. So anxiety is what you have, it's not what you are. You have anxiety to survive. It's a massive neurochemical survival response. But since you feel it, we tend to identify with it. Anxiety is your bodyguard if you say, this is what I have to survive. This is, this is what I need to survive. It's necessary to survive. I'm not getting rid of anxiety. Is, trying to control anxiety is like trying to stop, stop this dragster with bicycle handbrakes. It's not possible, right? In fact, a dragster can't even be stopped with brakes. You have to have a parachute to stop this thing. This dragster has 11,000 horsepower, and you're not going to stop it. You can't control it. However, what human consciousness does, it does give you the steering wheel. You do have a choice. Animals just simply go by their chemical reactions. Their goal is to feel neutral or great. Remember, we survive by gravitating towards rewards, and we survive by avoiding stress, right? So in adults, and I'm sorry, human beings, why is chronic pain so persistent? And this is where it gets really interesting because the neuroscience is now showing us that emotional pain, thoughts, concepts that are unpleasant go to the same part of the brain as a physical threat. But you can't escape your thoughts. Every human being is subjected to a certain number of thoughts or a high percent of thoughts that are unpleasant. The research term for that is called URTs, unpleasant repetitive thoughts. We can suffer with them, which we all know how to do that. What got me in deep trouble is that I was fearless. I was a master at suppressing anxiety. I didn't know what it was. I went from literally no anxiety. I mean, my attitude was bring it on. I went to one of the top spine fellowships in the world. I was a complex spine surgeon for many years. And in one night, I went from no anxiety to a panic attack. How can that be? So once that panic attack started, for the next 13 years, I could not stop it. Panic attacks, anxiety, all sorts of stuff. It was brutal. Then my ears started to ring. My feet started to burn. Migraine headaches. My stomach was a problem. Back pain, neck pain. There's over 30 symptoms of ongoing exposure to stress, chemicals. So your thoughts are coming at your brain the same way as a physical threat. And by the way, the third way of coping with Thoughts is masking, it's where the addictions come into play, right? And so my addiction was being a workaholic. Hasn't quite been solved yet, but nonetheless, my addiction. But it works to start a lot larger. You just crowd everything else out. You don't feel the anxiety so much. So between being a workaholic and totally suppressing it, I honestly didn't know what anxiety was. And it exploded into a panic attack in one day. <clears throat> then what happens that these sensations get connected with more and more life experiences. So they're reinforced. And the current definition of chronic pain is that it is an embedded memory that becomes linked with more and more life experiences and the memory can't be erased. It used to be that pain was something, was pain that lasted more than the expected healing time. This is the new definition out of Chicago. This is a great paper. This too was published in 2014 out of the same group in Chicago, Dr. Dr. Apkarian's lab and his colleagues. And every month they're publishing two or three papers on neuroscience of pain. What they found out, they took a group of volunteers who had acute back pain. They did functional MRI scans on this group. They found out that the nociceptive center for back pain lit up. This was back pain less than three months. Then they took a group with back pain more than 10 years, and they found out that the nociceptive center went dormant, wasn't, wasn't happening, 
and only the emotional center lit up. In other words, you had the same pain, but a different driver. Then they took the acute group, they scanned them every three months for a year. They found out half those people resolved, everything went dormant, but half the group went on a chronic pain. In every one of those patients, the pain shifted from the pain center to the emotional center. This is a neurological problem. These are memorized circuits. You are not going to unlearn them, okay? And you cannot be as skilled at riding a bicycle after 20, 30 years or whatever, but you can't unlearn how to ride a bicycle. You can't unlearn how to speak English. You can't unlearn how to walk. Now, you may be compromised for different reasons, but actually trying to unlearn that skill is essentially impossible. I actually quit my surgical practice in December because ha what's happening is that essentially every intervention we do in chronic pain does not work. So when you're doing procedures for a neurological problem, it's not gonna work. You gotta reprogram. And what happened with our process, I did write the book, Back in Control, A Surgeon's Room About a Chronic Pain. There's a website I'll put up in a second called backincontrol.com. And my intention with the book and the website was to give anybody who was taking care of patients the background, the book's a framework of what pain is, and it's the why things work. The website's the action plan, and it's something people do indefinitely. We have well over, th well over a thousand patients that have gone to pain-free, and they do go to pain-free. Not only do they go to pain-free, their anxiety drops, their creativity comes back, but they start to thrive at a level that they never thrived before in their entire lives. So as watching that, in the same time I'm watching spine surgery, there's not one research paper, not one, that documents that a spine fusion for back pain works, not one. So I'll just ask the room a question. So if I was your surgeon, you had back pain for two years, you're really frustrated, and I told you I had a 90% chance of helping your back pain out with a fusion, how many would do that? Okay. Okay, how many would not do that? Okay. Now what if I told you the success rate was 75%, how many would do that? What if I told you it was 50%? The actual success rate for a spine fusion for back pain is 22% at two years, 22%. We also know that disc degeneration does, disc degeneration does not cause back pain, yet, is, it, yet it is the reason why we do back fusions. There's not one research paper in 50 years that documents that a spine fusion works for back pain, not one. So we're operating on a normal spine for somebody's age. It's been document, documented to not be a source of pain. The success rate is 22%. But we're somewhere between 10 and 20 billion dollars a year with that operation. I saw three to five patients every week having these big operations done with horrible consequences. Devastating. And I walked into a patient's room one day who had surgery, 31 years old, did not need surgery, paralyzed. 31 years old. That was it. I actually quit my practice to say, look, mainstream medicine is not understanding this at all. And by the way, this paper documents, it's a meta-analysis, very recent paper, whether it's heart, knees, backs, actually this is focused on knees and backs, that there is no intervention <clears throat> that is effective in treating chronic pain, not one. So the conclusion of this paper was, there's little evidence for the specific efficacy beyond sham for invasive procedures in chronic pain. A moderate amount of evidence does not support the use of invasive procedures as compared with sham procedures for patients with chronic back or knee pain. Given the high cost and safety concerns, more rigorous studies are required before invasive procedures are routinely used for patients with chronic pain. <clears throat> this is right there. And as you all know, the business of medicine is pushing us hard to do procedures. <clears throat> no, I'm not against surgery. I'm not against procedures if it's in the context of the whole process. In other words, if a procedure gives somebody symptomatic relief for three or six months or a year, that's great. Remember, these are invasive procedures. These are not manipulations, not acupuncture, not chiropractic. These are invasive procedures, rhizotomies, except, in fact, they took, rhizo <clears throat> they took rhizotomies and epidurals out of this whole equation. I mean, it's been well documented that epidural injections do not work for axial back pain. They just don't work. So what's happening with this memorized pathways is really similar to the phantom limb pain, but as phantom pain occurs any part of the body, chest biopsies, hernias, whatever, 
And in fact, if you operate, do a structural operate inter intervention in the presence of untreated chronic pain, you can induce chronic pain at the new surgical site up to 40% of the time. Five to 10% of the time, it can become permanent. If I had a neurological complication rate in my spine practice of five to 10%, I wouldn't be in practice. We don't discuss with their patients, it's, I can cause chronic pain at your hernia site in the presence of chronic neck pain or make your back pain worse. And we see this all the time. So as he came to the workshop, and my wife was with me, <coughs> Dr. Fred Leskin, and my whole goal is to, I know people in chronic pain become socially isolated, so my goal is to create a structured environment that was safe and just do shared experiences together. And by Wednesday, Esty's pain was gone. By Friday, it was really gone, and she was so excited and we were shocked. The whole group, except for two people, had their pain disappear. We were shocked. And I'll explain why we think that happened in a second. We've done the workshop, I think, eight times now. Every year, I have anxiety about it. And it happens every year. And Esty is now married. She is working full time. No pain, no medications. We're gonna see her next week. We keep in touch with her, and she, it's just been incredible watching her go. That's what makes chronic pain exciting, is watching people go from no hope to thriving. And she basically did it on her own. <clears throat> okay, so I'm asking a question that's sort of rhetorical. Uh, you, you won't give me the answer I'm looking for, but I'm just gonna ask the question. So, any, Honestly, any questions about the concept the anxiety simply describes the state of your body's chemistry under stress? That makes sense to people? Okay. And it's 11 million to 40, okay? I can't control it. How do you, how do you decrease anxiety? I'm, I'm gonna volunteer you right here since you're so close to the front. How, how do you decrease anxiety? What's that? Okay, I think those, that's a good answer. It's not the one I'm looking for, but that is a good answer, yes. That's another good answer, but not the answer I'm looking for. Yes. That's, that's also a good answer, getting closer. That's another way of doing it. Ryan? Moving, another, those, 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 okay. So, the answer I mentioned, no, these are all ways of doing it, but and we're gonna talk about that in a second. Here's a paradigm, if you walk out of this lecture with no other point, this is it. Okay, anxiety represents elevated stress chemicals. It's 11 million to 40. So it's just a sensation, it's not who you are. It's what you have, it's not who you are. <clears throat> okay, so we decrease anxiety, simply decrease the stress chemicals. That's the paradigm that's gonna change your life. Get rid of the word anxiety. To say my stress chemicals are elevated. This car almost ran me off the road. Well, that stressed me out. My stress chemicals are up. Obviously, you were anxious, maybe upset, that's fine. But the key issue, all the answers we got are ways of doing that, but the problem is you get focused on all the ways of doing it, but we lose sight of the big picture is that this stress reaction is what keeps us alive, it's uncontrollable, it's necessary. The way you decrease anxiety is simply decrease the stress chemicals. The first step is to separate from it. I want you to visualize a large thermometer. Let's take that column right there, large thermometer. And just read your anxiety right this second. Like, maybe this is really upsetting me, or maybe I'm feeling sort of relaxed. Maybe the thermometer's at zero. Maybe it's up a little bit. Maybe if you're having trouble at home, your anxiety's up a bit. So just visualize that thermometer. And when you do get anxious and frustrated, just drop your shoulders a little bit. Relax, okay? And that's a direct way of doing it. But I want each one of you, just for two minutes, take that piece of paper in front of you, and I just want you to write down right now just how you feel. Two minutes, just write it down. Everybody, please. Just write some thoughts. Everybody grab your pen and paper.
could be anything, positive, negative, whatever it is. And just keep writing. I honestly, just keep writing. You may not have, you may not think of anything to say, but just write. It could be words, it could be doodling. Just keep your pen on the paper for about 90 seconds to two minutes. Just keep it going. We're at 30 seconds right now. And I'll just tell you briefly that this is the exercise that after 13 solid years of suffering, it broke the cycle within two weeks. And it's the one exercise we'll talk about in some detail a little bit later that I went through counseling, psychotherapy, all sorts of stuff, got worse. Within two weeks after I started the writing, started, things started to break up. I didn't know about the research on it. I didn't know, I thought it was this book I was reading. I had no idea the compressive writing had any benefit at all. I just started to write. And with every patient that I've seen to go pain-free, the one mandatory step, the only mandatory step is the expressive writing. If I quit doing my own expressive writing, within about two weeks, as little skin rashes pop up, my scalp itches, my wife starts making fun of me because they start scratching my scalp a little bit, um, my feet start to burn, my ears start to ring, all sorts of things start to happen. And I still have a certain amount of disbelief ar around this, but the research is deep. Okay, go ahead and stop. I want you to instantly take the piece of paper up and just tear it up. Please, everybody do that. <clears throat> okay, then I want you to all drop your shoulders. Just take a deep breath. I just want you to listen to sounds. <clears throat> then relax your jaw muscles. Drop your shoulders. Let your hands relax. Feel your, feel your chair. Okay. One more. Drop your jaw muscles, shoulders, hands. That's it. We call it active meditation. So what happens, the two ways of decreasing your stress chemicals, <clears throat> we're getting rid of the word anxiety, is you de-adrenalize your nervous system and also stimulate neuroplasticity, which decreases the reactivity of the nervous system. In other words, stress isn't the problem, it's a chemical reaction to the stress. So what you're doing, you're training your brain to have less of a reaction to stress. Because as you all know, stress isn't the problem, it's the reaction, and avoiding stress is stressful. Then I get a little frustrated in our physician burnout lectures because people say, well, manage your stress. Well, the stress that's stressful is the stress that you can't manage, right? So that stress, the stress you can manage, you do it. The stress that you can't manage, you can't. That's the most stressful stress. So there's two ways of doing it. One is to de through direct means. We just did two of them. One is simply writing. And you're going to leave here with three tools and two concepts. The three tools are expressive writing. I'd like you just mentally commit to say, I'm going to do five to 10 minutes of this every morning, maybe at night. Then again, drop your shoulders for a second. The active meditation is about three to five seconds all day long. Just you know, a little bit frustrated, just drop your shoulders. How many of you felt a little relaxed when you did that? Just eat a little bit, okay? So it's just, you know, it's a temporary drop. And the thing with chronic pain, chronic pain is complicated. There's multiple factors that affect it. We keep throwing random simplistic solutions to a complex problem. So with everybody in this room, everybody has their thing that they do for pain, which is great. But if you're doing your thing and the patient's not sleeping, it's not gonna work as well. So what these concepts do is they allow you to understand pain, allows you to do what you do better, then the patient takes care of their own sleep, their own life outlook, their own medications, et cetera. So mindfulness works, but not in isolation. The three aspects of healing chronic pain is simply understanding the problem. Number two, treating every aspect simultaneously. It's like fighting a forest fire. The third part is since you're unique, pain's complex, the only person that can solve this is you. So the other thing that's gonna change your life today, I'm completely absolving every one of you for being responsible for your patient's pain. I'm charging you with being re responsible for really doing a great job with what you do. The patient has to do the rest. But the other technique, neuroplasticity, we just talked about, is awareness, separation, and reprogramming, <clears throat> okay? What I think that the expressive writing does, it does awareness of the thoughts. Remember, you can't escape your thoughts, you're simply separating. Remember, we talked about the first step in dealing with anxiety is what you have, it's not who you are, it's not your identity. Visualize a thermometer, that's one way of separating. But the expressive writing has your thoughts here, you're here, 
There's a space that's now connected with vision and feel as part of the unconscious brain. Then when you do a little active meditation, again, drop your shoulders, you simply redirect it. So it's awareness, separation, reprogramming. Now with repetition, I maybe do it 20, 30 times a day consciously, but we actually teach us during our surgical procedures, if you're a little bit frustrated, drop your shoulders, go to feel. So the two concepts today is education and sleep. And I'd like to encourage you to continue to learn about chronic pain. We're not gonna talk about sleep today. But the three tools I'm gonna to ask you to go home with, is number one, expressive writing. Number two, the act of meditation. We just did both of those. The third one we'll talk about in a second is not discussing your pain. Because if you're talking about your pain or complaining, where's your attention? So think in terms of neuroplasticity, not psychology. This is my book, it's available on Barnes & Noble's, Amazon, um, some, a lot of bookstores have this, Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. This is the second edition. The website's backincontrol.com. And again, my intention, it's free, no emails, nothing, is in your practice, let your patients use this. In other words, unload most of this to your patients, then concentrate on what you do. There's a book here, by, written by Dr. Penny Baker and Dr. Smythe, <clears throat> called Opening Up by Writing It Down. And there's over a thousand research paper, over a thousand. These are some of the references in the back. The document, the, the, effect, the effectiveness of expressive writing. It's unbelievable. I never was taught about this in any part of my training, anywhere. Over a thousand papers, yet now one research paper on spine surgery being effective, it's not right. There's something wrong there. We talked about the act of meditation just dropping down your shoulders. By the way, sleep is number one. You have to sleep. In other words, this entire lecture is somewhat null and void if you're not sleeping. Now, as you learn, of course, de as you learn to de-adrenalize your nervous system, of course, then sleep is better, but you gotta sleep. <clears throat> so the final one, okay, so there are three tools. I'm gonna ask you to commit to expressive writing for the rest of your life, by the way. Three to five, 10 minutes a day, more if you want. I wrote like a demon when I first started writing. And then the relaxation, just do today, just drop it down. Before you go to bedtime night, just you know, take a minute or two, write down some thoughts, but you have to tear them up. And the reason why you tear them up is for two reasons. One is to write with freedom, and then the other one is to not analyze them. Because if you're analyzing your thoughts, where's your attention? It's on the thoughts, right? So when you talk about learning another language, is that you don't learn French by trying not to speak English, right? You're not gonna learn how to be out of chronic pain by trying to fix your pain. The default language is survival, and the language I'm proposing is an enjoyable life. In other words, what do you want your life to look like and pursue it? You're not gonna learn French by trying to fix your English. You're not gonna learn how to live an enjoyable life by trying to fix your pain. Again, 11 million to 40, you might as well put your hand right into a hornet's nest. It's not gonna work. So if you're my patient, let's say you're in my office, let's say, look, when you walk out of my office, you will never discuss your pain ever again the rest of your life, ever. Especially with your family, only with your providers. No complaining, no advice giving. I'm sorry, my wife is here to witness this. <laughs> but just stop. Your brain's gonna develop wherever you place its attention. Think about terms of neuroplasticity. This is not even philosophy or psychology. It sort of combines all this in one sentence. Just don't complain. Because remember, the mental pain's a bigger problem than the physical pain. If you're complaining, again, where's your brain? So we learned this at Omega. I'm gonna ask my wife to come up here for a second. Is that reprogramming is awareness, separation, reprogramming. The writing does awareness, separation. The reprogramming is a little active meditation. A more complex way of doing that is forgiveness, which is awareness of the anger, forgiveness of separation, and play is a great way to reprogram. That can happen, that's why SD, we think of better so quickly, because as my wife put us through some of these rhythms, honey, you're ready, we're ready for you. So she's gonna demonstrate a little bit what she did at the, at the workshop. Let's so try and get this um, to work. But what happened at Omega is a shared experience that was pleasant, and people started, people started to laugh. 
So this is Babs. Hi. She is a professional tap dancer. <laughs> and I am rhythm stunted. I don't need to I'm doing this. No, I, I'm just going to have... Can everybody stand up for a second? <clears throat> what? What? Okay. Um, we're just going to move a little to um, some rhythm. Uh, Dr. John, who's no longer with us, or maybe he is, I don't know. Um, all right, so we're just going to uh, get, get the music going. Okay, so I just want you to sway back and forth on the beat. year at our workshop, um, uh, someone with um, multiple degrees and very in her head said, well, what does this have to do with neuroplasticity? And we actually did a lot more complicated rhythms at, at tables. And I said, um, well, this is about neuroplasticity because you're actually learning new rhythm patterns like learning a foreign language. And it was, I made it difficult enough so people were struggling and a, a, a bit upset with me in the first day or two. But then they started getting it and they started laughing because of it was a little challenging. And we were using cups and things to beat on. But um, eventually, people just broke out of their um, nervous uh, focus on their pain selves. And we, we didn't lose anybody. <laughs> um, that was good. OK, so this is just the last little rhythm. So can you hold this? We're just going to do a step. Well, I think I finished. Anyway, <laughs> we also did we did juggling, but the the whole cross body movement is also. Um, I just said there's probably many people that know that in this room and how helpful that is to cross the body. So we're just going to put the music on, and you're going to try to follow me with those three 
separate rhythms, just step clapping, then step clap, step clap, step clap, clap, and then step clap, hit, hit, step clap, hit, hit. No. All right, that's the fun part. Now you can sit down and listen to Dr. Hanscom. All right. Ryan, it's okay. What I'd like to do is, I'm gonna take an extra five minutes and we've got about a 15 minute break. We'd like everybody to break up into groups of two or three just at your table, just make little circles and chairs. And I want you to commit to each other that yes, I'm gonna do the expressive writing, what time of the day, and then also commit to the act of meditation. But I also want you to really commit no complaining, no discussing your pain, no gossiping, no advice. Just listen and watch what happens to your brain. And of course you're gonna fail. I'm not the best at this, but I'm working. I am, I am honestly committed to a work in progress, but it does change your brain. So just go ahead and take, take, we'll take about five minutes and just talk to the people next to you about how you're going to implement these tools. And then one final thing is, what, why wouldn't you do it? Because there's actually an inherent resistance to this from patients about the writing, including myself. There's a certain amount of disbelief, but again, over a thousand research papers says that it works. Anyway, go ahead, just take five minutes and just talk to each other.
Okay, well, thank you. Um, so we're going to finish up the next last seven minutes just with some questions. So, I'd like to uh, open the floor for some questions or comments about the whole scenario. Did anybody have their concepts about anxiety change today? So again, to review, you're not going to control anxiety. It's what you have. It's not who you are. Who you are is this conscious brain over here. But by separating those two out, it allows you to live your life. You need anxiety for new challenges to stay safe. Okay. But once you separate this survival reaction from your consciousness, you start to thrive. It's really, really good. So I guess my first question is that any questions from the group as far as this whole process? Let me just, did you have a question? Yeah. You started out talking about anxiety. Right. Then you switched to stress. Right. And are you equating the two? Yes. Anxiety says danger. In other words, remember, anxiety is simply a measure of your stress chemicals. Okay, so it's just a descriptor. It's not a diagnosis. That's the, key. That's the one factor I really want to make today. Anxiety is just a description of your elevated stress chemicals, period. End of story. So my cat has it. She doesn't, she doesn't have consciousness, at least not as, um, she's not worried about dinner tomorrow or what somebody says about her, right? So remember, thoughts create the same chemical reaction as a physical threat. You can't escape your thoughts. All of us have sustained exposure to these stress chemicals that we can't escape. The writing simply separates you from those thoughts. And again, the data is deep. And remember, within three months for back pain, that the pain goes from the pain center to the chronic center, to the emotional center. Emotional pain and physical pain are processed in the same part of the brain, same chemical reaction, but the emotional pain is sustained. That's why the mental pain is so much of a bigger problem than the physical pain, because those elevated stress chemicals create physical symptoms. So each organ has its own response to adrenaline, cortisol, and histamines. So the immune system, cardiovascular disease, stress, anxiety, migraine headaches. I mean, migraine headaches, adrenaline shuts down the blood supply to the brain, frontal lobe, then you relax, then it expands, bam, you have a migraine. Migraine headaches respond beautifully to this process. One of the basic things that responds, I had tinnitus ringing in my ears for 25 years. Never thought it would go away. Well, guess what? Stress chemicals double the nerve conduction. So then also you get sensations that you wouldn't ordinarily have. So my tinnitus, tinnitus is gone. My ears are sensitive. I've got to still protect my ears. But the basic ringing is gone. I never thought that would go away, ever. So again, anxiety is just as, so anxiety, and so stress is the stimulus, the chemical reaction is the response, which creates a sensation. Again, we're getting rid of the word anxiety. When I am stressed, my stress chemicals are elevated. Visualize your thermometer. You can directly decrease it, or you can utilize neuroplasticity. I mean, you have to do both, of course. I mean, the goal is as you utilize neuroplastic tools, which are on the website. So again, the website's backincontrol.com. I didn't bring my prior book, but all of this is in the book. I just published, this book will be released in one week, or October 29th. It's called, Do You Really Need Spine Surgery? It's intended for practitioners like yourself to, to help your patients make the correct decision about surgery. Right now, the spine surgeons say, you need surgery. Nobody can really argue with them. But again, the non-operative care became so effective and so many patients went to pain-free, even with surgical lesions, that my surgical practice dropped to only 4% of my patients that I saw in the clinic. I literally put myself out of business. So this book's arranged on a grid, and it's really easy to put your patient or yourself into one of these quadrants on the grid. And if you're straightforward, rupture disc, get it done. If you have nothing to operate on, don't do the surgery. Probably 70% of spine surgery should not be done right now. I, at least. Um, other questions? Any other comments? From the, from the, yes? Right. So the, the data shows when you do functional MRI scans on kindergartners that almost the whole brain is actually involved. You're taking a thought and processing it and turning it into a motor function. So we think that the, there's another paper came out recently that suggests that the writing is really critical. 
probably the second best thing is the verbal expressive writing. You actually can verbalize your thoughts. And it does the same thing. Somehow you've externalized them. And again, it's really, really critical to tear up the piece of paper. Because you're not. this is not a catharsis exercise. It's just a separation exercise. OK, because if you analyze them, it's a problem. If you think you're catharsing, you're wrong. There are trillions of thoughts in your brain. And so it's just a separation. Look at it as an exercise. You can do creative writing and other types of writing, vision setting, goal setting, et cetera. But this is just an exercise. And most of the research, by the way, has been done on negative writing. It turns out it doesn't matter. Also, it turns out that the expressive writing helps people sleep. Research done on that. And then the effects, this is, I mean, I would suggest to look at this book because it's unbelievable. Like, decreased heart disease, obesity, anxiety, athletic performance, engagement with treatment protocols. It's unbelievable what the simple exercise does. I actually interviewed Dr. Pennebaker on my podcast, which is on my website. He's in Austin, Texas, great guy. His daughter lives in Seattle. And about four of us had dinner with him one night. We asked, well, Jamie, how does this work? I mean, why does this expressive writing work? He goes, I don't know. And so we don't know. And I think that's why there's a certain amount of disbelief with this, because I have had remarkable success personally with it. And then I quit doing it. I mean, I go, I go what? It seems, it seems like such a simple thing. But again, like I mentioned before, within two or three weeks, my symptoms start coming back. It's my wife and I started, well, we both write. We both committed to writing sort of proactively. We'd often sort of get ourselves, get our symptoms back and start writing again. Why not just do it proactively? It's like brushing your teeth, even 30 seconds. So anyway, um, my time is up. One more question. Oh, this is called Opening Up by Writing It Down by Dr. James Pennebaker. And it just gives you the data that you need to really say, you know something? I need to do this. I mean, we should have been taught this in actually kindergarten. This is not on my website. You, you, I do need to reference that on the website. Anyway, thank you very, very much. I'm excited to be here. And thank you, Babs.